Hello. Hello. Welcome. I don't know if you've heard about this, but uh, as of next Sunday, some of the restrictions have changed. Yay. Oh, thank you. Woo. Okay. I was on my way back from Saskatoon and I was listening to a podcast and I wasn't paying attention to the news and all of a sudden my phone started to ring and vibrate as people said, hey, the, re the restrictions have changed and we're able to meet together. So double checked on that stuff. Listen, we've been praying for this and I am so excited about this. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about what you can expect starting next week, but first... You might notice to my right, we have Cheryl Glass. Hello, Cheryl. How are you? I'm better now. I'm okay, good. <laughs> glad, glad to see you. If you are a kid for kids church, can I get you to stand and I'm going to pray for you. Then once I'm done praying for you, we're going to get you to go out this door right here. Okay, cool. All right, let me pray for us. Lord God, we want to thank you for the rich blessing uh, that children are. We want to thank you uh, for people who are gifted to teach children and who have uh, answered the, the call you have for them to teach and to teach well. Thank you for the Glass family who has worked hard uh, in preparation for this. Thank you for our kids. Let them hear not only your voice, but also your tone. Let it be forever invitational to them. Thank you, Lord God. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, you guys can head this way. So starting next week, it's going to be a little bit different. First of all, you don't need to sign up. Now, the reason that I say that is because the way that the regulations work, it is 30% of a building's capacity or 150 people, whichever is the smaller number. For us, that means 150 people. I don't expect that we're going to crowd that 150 number, uh, although I hope I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I will stand up here and gladly tell you I was wrong. Uh, but it means that starting next week, you can just come. They, uh, they say that two meters distance between the family units is something we need to take very seriously, and we are pleased to do that. And so we will put out more chairs, and they will be spaced out. Uh, but... Uh, uh, that's still something that we need to do. We're still going to need to wear masks. When you come in, you're still going to need to use the hand sanitizer and those sorts of things. We're going to figure this out as we go. It will be reminiscent of what was a little bit, and we will still be looking forward to the day when they say the regulations are that there are no more regulations. That will be a great day. But for this day, boy, I celebrated. I shouted. My steering wheel heard me cheer. It was good. Who here was excited to hear that? Go ahead, raise your hands. Good. I'm glad you're... I mean, and who here was just upset to hear that? Okay, there was no hands that went up. That's good. This is a church, and uh, we're going to hear in a few moments from Ty McKenzie. And Ty McKenzie has joined us from Saskatoon. But Ty, there's two things I want to tell you. Here's the first one. This is a church that prays. And we pray for each other. And we have some prayer uh, uh, requests that I'm going to read out. And once I'm done reading those prayer requests out, I want to encourage you, if I have missed one or if I don't know about one, I just want you to call out the name of the person we're praying for. I promise God will figure out what your real prayer is. But let me just go through this. I spent some time on the phone today with, uh, well, Karen Cornelson, but we we're talking, uh, you know, with Blair by extension. And there are people who are longtime members of this church, people who we love very much. For those of you who uh, don't know, Blair's got Parkinson's, Karen has got fibromyalgia, and it's a pretty serious medical situation there. And so we want to pray for them and for full healing. That has always been our prayer, and that will be our prayer. That comes, that's their request. That is their hope and their belief, and mine too. And so we are going to pray that way. Uh, Eric Friesen, many of you know who he is. He's the great big guy who comes here on Sundays. He's got this issue um, where he's got a vein in his, in his leg uh, down by his foot that keeps bursting and he keeps bleeding. And uh, he had another episode of this last night. So he's not with us today because it's bound up. Our prayer for him has always been for full healing. And uh, getting him into a hospital and getting them to address this has been quite a challenge. And uh, some of you will understand what that means. 
So we pray for full healing for Eric and for Doreen that ha- who has to put up with Eric while he bleeds. That's got to be a that's got to be a challenge. He's a friendly guy, but he's a bleeding friendly guy. That's that's no fun. So we remember the Friesen family. Uh, if you were paying attention to the prayer chain this week, there is a person named Tom, uh, and Tom had a brain aneurysm. Tom got rushed into the hospital in Saskatoon where they did a surgery. He's out of the surgery. He is verbal. He is healing. That's a long, long journey ahead of him, and we don't know much. We just know that he is uh, reasonably conscious now. I think he's still very heavily medicated, but uh, reasonably conscious. Our prayer for him, for his family, and for those who care about him is for full healing. The great physician, the Holy Spirit, has him in his hands. And so we pray for that. The last thing is for Beth Summick. Now, lots of you know Beth, and Beth is a wonderful part of this church. She is a teenager who is, um, yeah, we love her a whole bunch. And she had some pretty serious surgery done, and she is healing. There's a bunch of things that go into that. Not only the physical healing and swelling and all that sort of stuff, but what she can eat and what she can't eat, how she can sleep, which is propped up in the chair. There's all kinds of stuff that is new and uncomfortable and um, she uh, she would prefer it all to go away and so we pray for her and that she will heal and heal fully and heal quickly and be comfortable and can join us again uh, where we can just celebrate her being with us so what have I missed go ahead call out the names of the people who we should pray for If you're watching at home and there's someone who you're yelling at your TV, text it and I'll get Jared to call it out and we will pray for these people as well. Anyone else we can pray for? Okay, I will invite you to, let's stand together. Lord God, you've told us to come to you and cast our cares on you. You've told us to bring to you the the sick, the sad, the scared. We're glad to do it, God. It is part of my testimony that you heal. It is, uh, you've healed me personally, you've also healed, uh, and I've watched you do it. It's miraculous, it draws me closer to you and it draws others closer to you. And Lord God, when we ask for healing, it is not that, it's not so that we are more comfortable, but rather so that we are more holy as you heal us and as you change us. It's part of sanctification. And so we call out to you and we ask for healing. Lord God, for the Cornelson family, Uh, And there are many medical things going on there. Holy Spirit, come heal. Heal from the surgeries. Heal from the sicknesses, from Parkinson's, from fibromyalgia, migraines. Holy Spirit, come and heal. Reach into these people. Take those broken cells. Replace them with cells that are whole. We will use this as testimony. We call out to you for this, Lord. For Eric and this, this uh, problem, that c- it keeps happening. Uh, Lord God, it, it's, uh, the first time that it happened, it was scary. The second time that it happened, it was scary. And now here we are, third or even fourth time this is happening. Holy Spirit, come and heal. Reach into his body, this vein that keeps bursting. Heal this vein, Lord God. Let this not happen again. Let Eric and Doreen and their children know that the healing has happened. Let them know that it is permanent. And draw them closer to you, Lord God. We ask that you reach into, into his body and, and heal. Uh, we think about the stress that uh, exists for Doreen and that and for, um, for their children. Lord God, as, as uh, you don't know what to expect and what you can and cannot do. Holy Spirit, we lift them up to you. For Tom, with the brain aneurysm, Lord God, reach deep. Lord, heal. 
we, we, we ask you, Holy Spirit, come heal this brain aneurysm. Return Tom to a healthy life. Let him be able to think. Let him be able to speak. Let him be able to see all of those things that are so often connected with brain issues. Holy Spirit, come and heal him fully. Let it be entirely convincing to him and to those around him that it was you who healed, that this is a miraculous healing that comes from the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the fine medicine that they were able to access. We thank you for the skillful surgeons, the wise medical teams. Holy Spirit, thank you for working already. Continue to work and continue to heal. For my friend Beth, as she heals, as she sits at home right now, Lord, we pray for this discomfort. Uh, we know that uh, the surgery is done. Now we are, it's just healing. Let this discomfort disappear quickly. Let it be so that she can sleep properly, that she can move. And uh, uh, all of the things that are a challenge for her right now. Lord, don't let there be any infections or any of that sort of stuff. Let this healing be very quickly so that she can get back to being who she is. Bring her back to us soon, Lord God. We pray for the Summock family as they watch and also as they are caregivers to her. Uh, make them gentle and uh, let this healing happen very quickly, Lord God. Thank you for this. For all of the requests that are too deep to be spoken, Lord, we know that you hear them. Holy Spirit, come. Come and work deep in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. So Ty, the first thing I wanted to tell you was we're a praying church. Here's the second thing I want to tell you is uh, you have this Sunday landed in the best church. I'm telling you, it's the best church and it's full of the best people. We're not perfect, but we're highly favored by God. And... Uh, he calls us his sons and daughters. So as much as I welcome you here, I also want to say, boy, you're lucky. And congratulations, that was, that was skillful on your part. I'm teasing you about that. I, I invited you to come and I'm glad that you came, but I just want you to know these are special people. Special people, let's treat Ty really well. As Ty comes, uh, he'll tell us a bit about himself, but what you need to know about Ty, or what I can tell you right off the top, is that uh, he's connected with Lighthouse Assisted Living in Saskatoon. Several weeks ago, we had a, quite a significant load that went out there, uh, and which uh, they were pleased to receive, but I think we were even more pleased to be able to give. I also have a huge pile of clothing in my office right now that's going to go home with you, and, and uh, this will be used to uh, this will be used to glorify God. Is that, that's how that'll really be used. So, Ty, come on up. I want to embrace you with a great big hug and welcome you. I can't do it. So, this is my virtual hug for you. For those of you watching at home, uh, we've got something special for you. So, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Well, thank you very much. I'm so pleased to be able to join you today. It's an honor to be here. I uh, love the drive out here, especially when it's uh, relatively sane and there's not tons of Alberta license plates screaming past me. But uh, it's great to be here and uh, grew up in... Uh, in rural Manitoba, just in the, the western part of Manitoba, wasn't quite to the promised land. We were just east of the Rough Rider line, but we could see the uh, we could see the Rokenville potash mine from our back window, so we were pretty close. But uh, it's great to be able to come and to share with you a little bit of God's heart for for justice. I can take this off just before I sing. Uh, God's heart for justice, for his faith community, uh, for the lighthouse supported living and how we can uh, be part of what he wants to do wherever we are at. And so as we begin, I acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory. It's the home of the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, 
the Lakota and Dakota people and the homeland of the Métis. I am so grateful for the treaties. It is because of them that my great-grandfather was able to flee religious and economic persecution to settle in Treaty 6 territory just east of Edmonton. And while uh, we, I, our family, have benefited greatly, there are many people who have not benefited as a result of the treaties, some of whom have become uh, my close friends. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about their story. Well, that story is reminiscent to me of a lady that we met as we started to volunteer at the Lighthouse. Her name is Mary McNeil, and Mary grew up in Calgary. She was part of what was known as the 60s Scoop, was adopted into a white family in Calgary. And uh, her father would take her down to the Skid Row area, the downtown strip in Calgary, where they would throw pennies at the drunk Indians. So she grew up not really knowing much of her own background, her heritage, her culture, and uh, <clears throat> was troubled as a, as a young person, ran away from home many times. And on one of these occasions, she found herself at social services and overheard some of the co-workers speaking about her and asking, what should we do about that little Indian girl? That was the first time that she understood what her heritage and background and culture was. And it plunged her into decades of running all over Western Canada, where she was plunged into addictions of drugs and alcohol, lived a life on the streets with prostitution, and was trying to find a place to belong. That's when she came to Saskatoon and came to the lighthouse. She found folks who were ready to take her at her bottom where she was and started to put some of the pieces back together to the point in which she moved out into one of our homes in the community and uh, was able to start working. Start working at the lighthouse in our kitchen. And uh, as she would walk back and forth from her home in the community to the lighthouse, she saw many women who were living on the street and could easily identify with their struggles and what they were walking through and experiencing. And so she began what we called Harbor of Hope, a home where prostituted women could come and start to get a place where they could clean up and live. Unfortunately, we didn't know all that was involved in that ministry. And as a result, didn't put the kind of supports and staffing in place, and ultimately that home wasn't able to continue. I'm glad to say that there is a safe house that is run by a church or a Christian organization in the city now, but uh, Mary's story was something that just completely gripped our hearts. And as we got to know uh, Mary, it helped us to understand some of those layers of blame and shame and the identity that she was searching for. And with that in mind, let me just take a moment to pray before we continue. God, you know our story and how each one of us in some way are looking for identity. We've been searching, Lord. Whether we've come from a stable background or one that has had challenges, we're looking for a place to belong. And as we do that, we would ask, Lord, that you would lead us, that we'd be open to your guidance, that you'd help us to stay away from things that would uh, cause long-term destruction in our lives and help us to be open to the supports that people, friends, family members, and community would want to give to us. And so we are thankful for your grace and how it leads us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, speaking of identity, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about myself. As mentioned, I grew up in, in Manitoba and met my wife 
in Outlook, Saskatchewan. We were the only two singles in town, so uh, we were destined for each other. Plus, we had the Women's Prayer Fellowship praying for us, so it was a done deal. Uh, but that was 30 years ago. We moved from there to uh, Sherwood Park, Alberta, where we pastored, and my wife was a teacher in Strathcona Christian Academy for about 14 years, and we moved back to Saskatoon in 2005. And we have three grown children. Our oldest, Kayla, is married to Ben Giesbrecht, uh, something that her Mennonite mother-in-law, or my mother, Mennonite mother-in-law is very grateful for. And uh, they make their home in Meadow Lake, where they are both teachers and love it up there. Uh, their <coughs> back deck looks onto Meadow Lake Alliance Church, so uh, it's a short walk to church each morning. And uh, our middle son, Tease, is, is the taller one in the middle there. He is uh, finishing up his master's in music composition at University of Victoria, so he has his final project due in about a month here. And our youngest, Lane, is uh, loving all things outdoors in Abbotsford, BC, where he works as a ski patrol in Abbotsford and goes to Columbia Bible College. He uh, sent me a screenshot of going 106 kilometers down the mountain the other day, so to which his mother replied, were you wearing your helmet? So uh, Karen is a teacher in uh, Rosewood, the Colette Begonia School, one of the new schools on the, west, on the east side of the city and uh, loves being a music and band director, can hardly wait till uh, band students are able to put instruments back to their faces. And uh, we have been enjoying our time in the city. We uh, ended our ministry at Lawson Heights Alliance Church in 2017, where when I became the uh, spiritual care coordinator at the Lighthouse and are attending the Avalon Alliance Church currently, where uh, uh, Peter and Mandy's brother-in-law, Rob, is the pastor, and so we're really enjoying being part of that faith community. Well, this whole journey into um, this idea of justice and justice ministry really began with my love for the, the singer-songwriter that you just heard me sing, Bono and you too. And uh, one of his... Um, quotes that he gave at the National Prayer Breakfast is this. He says, God is in the slums, in the cardboard boxes where the poor play house. God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. And God is with us if we are with them. As we began our ministry at Lawson Heights, we did a, a tour of some of the uh, ministries in the city. The, uh, the IMED Warehouse, First Nations Alliance Church, the bridge on 20th Street, and the Lighthouse. And we wanted to take some time on a monthly basis to go and serve, to volunteer, to uh, uh, help those that were in need. And on at least two different occasions, the directors of these inner city ministries said words something to the effect of, we love volunteers, we'd be grateful to have you come and volunteer. What we're really looking for is someone to make an investment. And I kind of hung my head because I was willing to volunteer an hour a month, not willing to make an investment. It so happened that Jason Moore, who is making his tour on behalf of the Lighthouse, stopped by the church, and at that point, that is exactly what they needed. And so Jason invited us to come and spend what has become known since 2006 on a monthly basis as Sweet and Salty Night, where we bring goodies and we sing songs and we uh, uh, share and play games with the residents who are there. And it was Jason who reintroduced me to Isaiah 58, the words and the scriptures that the Lighthouse mission is based on. It says, Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring your homeless poor into your house 
when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. In many ways, I trace this God movement in my life back to the day that that scripture was reintroduced to me. I say reintroduced because I'm sure I had to read it during my Old Testament survey course. But reading it again in this context changed my life. And it helped me to start to understand God's heart for justice. So what is justice? Timothy Keller says, a deep social conscience and a life poured out in deeds of service to others and especially the poor is the inevitable sign of real faith and a real connection with God. Justice is the grand symptom of real faith. Or as Neil Planting talks about, it is shalom, that sense of webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in equity, fulfillment, and delight. Webbing together. Strings that are put together to form a quilt or a rug. If I were to take a bunch of thread and throw it down on the floor here, it wouldn't be a rug, it wouldn't be a quilt. No, the threads have to go over and around and under and through, each thread touching the other as nothing is falling through the cracks. You'll see some pictures of women from St. Anne's Church in Saskatoon who knitted, crocheted for our residents some prayer quilts. As they share, uh, started to crochet them, they would say prayers for whoever would be receiving them. And then they came and placed them around the shoulders of some of our residents at the lighthouse. And it was almost as if you could see them relax and peace be laid on them as they put these quilts, these these crocheted uh, blankets over them and as they prayed for them. Shalom, justice, quilts, webbing together, no one falling through the cracks. So what is poverty? Well, the World Bank says that poverty is about not having enough money to meet basic needs, including food, clothing, and shelter, but it's more than that. It's hunger, it's lack of shelter, it's being sick and not being able to see a doctor. It's not having access to school, not knowing how to read. It's not having a job, it's fear of the future. It's living one day at a time. It's got many faces and it changes from place to place across time. It's been described in many ways. Most often poverty is a situation that people want to escape. So it's a call to action for the poor and the wealthy alike. A call to change the world so that many more will have enough to eat, adequate shelter, access to education and health, protection from violence, and a voice in what happens in their communities. In our setting, how do we see poverty at the lighthouse? Basically, poverty is coming through the doors and having nothing that the world around you values. It's a lack of resources, yes, but it's also a lack of opportunities, a lack of relationships. And as we see it in Saskatoon at the Lighthouse Supported Living, some of the causes for poverty is racial inequality that stems from the residential school system, the 60 scoop and the foster care system. It's often brushes with the legal system. It includes mental illness, those who struggle with fetal alcohol syndrome, cognitive, uh, impairment. Sometimes they have a acquired brain injury or perhaps mobility issues. It's a loss of work due to a result of uh, some kind of a health concern. And it involves their struggles with addictions. All of this is creates this search for identity, this looking to find out who I am, where do I belong? And so how, how do we respond? Well, we realize that the world is economically broken. And so we respond with mercy. 
Proverbs 13 says, an unplowed field produces food for the poor, but injustice sweeps it away. They have these resources, but injustice even gets rid of the little that they have. Deuteronomy says, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. The world is economically broken, so we respond with mercy. The world is also socially broken, so we respond with justice. In Deuteronomy, again, it says, The Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, accepts no bribes, Bribes, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, loves the foreigner right, residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. How do we respond to poverty? Well, an 18th century fiery preacher by the name of Jonathan Edwards said this in his sermon, this is the sermon title, of the obligation of Christians to perform the duty of charity to the poor. It's a sermon just in the title. But this is what he says. This duty is absolutely commanded and much insisted on in the word of God. Where have we any command in the Bible laid in in stronger terms and in a more peremptory, urgent manner than to command the command of giving to the poor? We have the same law in a positive manner laid down in Leviticus. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and sojourner in your house and he shall live with you. So if you read a quote like that, you maybe do what I do. Look up the word peremptory. What does that mean? Well, peremptory is that it precludes or does not admit any debate. It's uh, decisive or final. It's a command that is absolute and unconditional. Here's Jonathan Edwards, someone that we would probably not describe as uh, a modern left-leaning socialist. If you remember, he wrote a sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And here he is saying that People should give, and there is no other commandment in the Bible laid down in more stronger terms. And why is this so striking? Because many people, myself included, think of ministry to the poor as an option. It's something we do if we're wired that way, if we're gifted in that regard, if we have a passion for it. In the church, we make it a department, we make it a committee, And that can let us off the hook because then we say, I'm glad we're doing it. It's not my thing, but at least someone's doing something. And then we read a quote like this from Jonathan Edwards saying there's nothing more clear, nothing more incapable of refusal than the Christian's duty to the poor, everyone. I live live in a suburban setting. I attend a church that's not in a poor area. But this is not for just churches near poor areas. It's all of us. Not only is it a command, but it comes with a blessing. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And as I hang out with folks who have little that the world has to offer, I understand what it means to experience poverty. Because if I was really honest, I would have to say that I'm middle class in spirit where I say, God, thank you for saving me. I got it from here. I don't really want to receive charity. I don't need to admit that I have needs. But how do we keep going in the face of all the need that is out there? Another fiery preacher from Scotland in the 1800s, Robert Murray McShane, put it this way. He says, the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He was the highest, therefore he stooped lowest. They gave their willing services, he gave himself. 
You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. And then he says, now, dear Christians, some of you pray night and day to be branches of the true vine. You pray to be made all over in the image of Christ. If so, you must be like him in his giving. A branch bears the same kind of fruit as the tree. If you be branches at all, you must bear the same fruit. An old divine says, well, what would have become of us if Christ had been as saving of his blood as some men are of their money? And then he goes on to raise some objections that we have. Objection one, my money is my own. Answer, Christ might have said, my blood is my own, my life is my own. No man forces it from me. Then where would we have been? Objection number two, the poor are undeserving. Christ might have said the same thing. They are wicked rebels against my father's law. Shall I lay down my life for these? I'll give to the good angels, but no. He left the 99, he came after the lost, he gave his blood for the undeserving. Objection number three, the poor may abuse it. Christ might have said the same, yet with far greater truth. Christ knew that thousands would trample his blood under their feet, that would, they would despise it. They would, many would make it an excuse for sinning more, yet he gave his blood. And then he says, dear Christians, if you would be like Christ, give much, give often, give freely to the vile and the poor, the thankless and the undeserving. Christ is glorious and happy and so will you be. It is not your money I want, I want your happiness. Remember his own word, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We live our lives of justice because Jesus, and for Jesus, not for us, not by just increasing our list and saying, oh, I need to add justice to my list. No, we do it for who he is, for beauty's sake, for the sake of those that we serve. And I read just this morning in my quiet time, if your compassion is going to resemble God's, you must abandon a cozy world of self-protection. God's compassion so that he showed it to us. He couldn't stay home. He couldn't stay above. And we need to help our friends. Of course, we're going to weep. It's going to hurt as we share in their sorrows. That's what God did for us. So how do we do it? How do we continue on? Well, we remember people. And in the... Uh, Three years that I've been part of the Lighthouse, I've uh, been part, of, tomorrow will be the 22nd memorial service that I will be doing. And in that, I've met some real characters. And these are some of the, the faces of some of the folks that you'll see coming up on the screen. During this time, as we have gotten to know them, as we have uh, spent time visiting in hospital, uh, we've gotten to know their story, gotten to know some of their background, gotten to know some of their personalities, some of their struggles, some of their family. And uh, I remember very vividly one of the first memorial services we had done, had, have done, it was with a gentleman named Gus. Gus was a real character. And... Uh, in fact, whenever I go and speak or if I'm doing something that requires a little um, energy or courage on my part, I wear these uh, socks because they have, a, they have a white bear on them. And it reminds me of Gus who grew up in the White Bear First Nation near Regina. Gus is, was told at his uh, memorial service on three, at least three occasions, he met the mayor, the chief of police, and the uh, bishop of the Presbyterian church. And as he met them, he said to them, your fly is down. And it, it helped me remember that we're all just people. We're all just normal guys. And Gus uh, was one that really taught me something. Another gentleman who, uh, I believe his name was Floyd, but everyone called him Bannock. Bannock had lived a really challenging life. And uh, he, when he was 
brought to the lighthouse. He'd been living on the street on non-palatable alcohol, hand sanitizers, rubbing alcohols, and hairsprays. And he came to be in our uh, managed alcohol program and he decided that he didn't want to die in the hospital. He wanted to die in his own room. And we got a chance to meet with him. And as I sat with him, he was going in and out of, of consciousness. He was sometimes lucid, sometimes not, sometimes babbling, sometimes asleep. And I said to him at one point, I said, Bannock, you know that the Creator wants you to be at home with Him in peace forever, right? And at that point, he looked at me, locked eyes, and said, Why not, eh? And for 2020, that became my password, my theme. Why not, eh? To have that kind of an attitude as you roll through the challenges of life. I also got to know Bear. Everyone knew him as Bear. And uh, he had talked about his life in the military and as a truck driver, but as a result of severe diabetes, lost a leg and was in the hospital. And uh, I took him to some of his appointments, I visited him in the hospital. As we went to his appointment, he was always had been very close to anything with relationship to spiritual things. In fact, one time as he met the people taking his information at the hospital, they asked him, who's your next of kin? To which he replied, the devil, which kind of gave a little bit of a shock to the person on the other side of the desk. But as we got to know each other, he always was willing to have me pray for him as I left his bedside. In fact, one day as I was wheeling him down to the bank to, uh, to cash a check, he said, without any initiation on my part, you know, when this is all over, I guess I will take you up on that invitation to go to your church. And then he left one uh, caveat. He said, but please make sure that nobody prays that I grow my leg back. Obviously, he had met some well-meaning, but a little bit... Uh, off the beaten track Christians in the past. So not only have I come to enjoy these friends and look forward to these interactions, but I've grown and I've learned so much. I've grown out of my, starting to grow out of my middle class in spirit faith. I'm learning resiliency in the face of hardship. I'm learning to foster a heart of gratitude. I'm learning to value each day and hold lightly the things of this world, to identify my habits and faults and addictions as secret sins as those that God wants me to give up in order to help me find real life in him. So we, we remember Jesus, we remember people, and thirdly, we remember opportunities opportunities that we see all around us. In my role as spiritual care coordinator, I've come to realize that when someone is in need at that moment, it's really important that I listen, I stop what I'm doing, and not ask them to make an appointment because there may not be another opportunity. We've had opportunities to have the Alpha course, to have Bible studies, to uh, do, as I've said, memorials and hospital visits, and the Lighthouse has been around for uh, over 25 years. It started in 92 as uh, what was called the Voyager Club, and over year, the years it became in 2007 a nonprofit that changed our name to the Lighthouse Supported Living. But our intentions are that we would end homelessness in Saskatoon. That's our goal to be a dynamic and innovative housing service provider, and then all of that to provide supports around that so people can keep their housing. So why do we do it? What do we do? We provide these wraparound services. We partner with the health region, with Saskatoon Police Service, with Justice, with uh, social services, mental health and addictions, with community living service delivery, with the city of Saskatoon, indigenous organizations. And uh, we're just one piece of the puzzle. There are many great organizations like the Salvation Army, the Saskatoon Tribal Council, the Friendship Inn, the uh, Saskatoon Food Bank, uh, all of these places that partner with us that are doing good work in the city that we share information and resources with. We love the work of so many great groups in our city. 
We have about 215 people that live within our building, approximately 95 staff between our location and the location in, the north, in north Battleford. We have a supported living tower. We also have an emergency shelter that uh, grows as we have some out of the cold uh, types of policies that take place, which has become a real challenge as we have, have to keep our folks spread apart. And so we've had to commandeer uh, literally rooms throughout the entire building, shut down the dining hall to make space for sh shelter beds because of the, the need to have people at least six feet apart. We uh, have a community kitchen that we do twice a week so that people outside within the community can come and have a hot meal. We have a stabilization unit where folks who are intoxicated or under the effects of drugs can come and sleep it off instead of having to spend time in jail cells or incarceration. We have an on-site care team that uh, is a nurse practitioner, three different nurse practitioners that provide nursing care throughout the week, psychiatric nurse, addictions counselors, care aides, uh, psychiatrists, a, a physician that comes one day a week. And we have uh, housing locators that help people to find stable housing as quickly as possible. We have an outreach van that takes people to their appointments that does about uh, 200 kilometers a day, 10 hours a day, and takes uh, food bank uh, hampers to people in the community, etc. And we have lots of ways that people can get involved. And I'm so glad to hear that you are a praying church. We, as some of the opportunities began to shrink and we weren't able to have um, some of the programming, we just started doing prayer walks in the community. And uh, we were praying through the inner city and asking for God to bless the city, to protect the city. And it's been such an encouragement as we have had people join us and as I've been able to pray through the inner city and seeing all of the aspects of the culture right there in the inner city. And so prayer is something that is really important and valuable to have people become part of. We invite you to do that. We love to have people come and give. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to have volunteers in the building for over a year now, but we love to have them come and serve by giving of their time, by uh, bringing packaged up food items that we're able to hand out in the communities, by donating items. We're so grateful for the truckload of, it, of stuff that you guys were able to give, uh, stuff that gets used very quickly, uh, those toiletries and socks and underwear and seasonal items that we give out on a daily basis. We're, you can uh, give through uh, giving of your cans and bottles and choosing the lighthouse as your chosen charity. Uh, you can become a monthly donor. Lots of ways to get involved, lots of ways to give. We also have a, uh, an adventure park near North Battleford. It's called Blue Mountain. It's uh, north and east of, of North Battleford where we can take some of our residents, some of our staff, get them a chance to get out of the, out of the city, out of the community to enjoy the zip lines and uh, the paintball and the lake and, and the trails and so on. And uh, it's just a great opportunity for folks to be able to get out of the city and to enjoy the outdoors. So there's all kinds of ways to be involved as we remember our opportunities that we have to serve. In closing, I just want to share what uh, has come out of the book, The Transformational Discipleship. And here we have this diagram of what they call the transformational sweet spot. It's where these three uh, entities, the mandates and the desires of God, the calling and the capacity of the local church, and the needs and the dreams of the city, which can sometimes be at odds with each other. But where do they come together? They come together in service, where no one can disagree with the value, the importance, and the need to serve those who need it. This is where the, the needs of your community, the calling of your church, and the mandate and the heart of God can come together in serving. And you know, sometimes God uses surprising 
situations to transform us. Uh, this past week, I recorded my 1,360th spiritual conversation with people in our Lighthouse community over the past three years. And one of them was with Gerald. Gerald, you'll see on the screen here, had suffered much in his life from trauma and loss of his family and culture to addictions, the breaking down of his body where he was now in a scooter. And he got very angry when he lost, or as he said, he had his identity, his, uh, his ID stolen from him. He was so upset about it that he just lost it on our front desk staff and said some really nasty things and got very angry. Our front line manager asked me to come and we pulled him aside and we sat down with him and said, Gerald, you know, we're sorry that you've had your ID stolen. We will do whatever we can to help you get it back. But please, you can't treat our staff that way to which he agreed. He said, I'm sorry, and he promised that he would try better. Well, I had an opportunity then to pray. I asked him if I could pray for him, and, I, and he said yes, and I prayed for him. And then I looked at Gerald, and I said, well, Gerald, the Lord bless you. And that's when he locked eyes with me, and he said these words without skipping a beat, the words that I'm going to leave with you. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Sometimes God shows up in the most surprising situations. As the worship team comes to conclude, let's close in prayer. Dear God, we are grateful that you do not want us to stay where we're at. And we look forward to the day when pain and suffering is gone. In the meantime, Lord, help us to understand the role that we have in whatever situation you've placed us in to be able to share the love, the grace, the compassion, and the justice of Christ as we look forward to the day when you put everything right, you right all the wrongs, and we're able to experience the glory that you want us to share with those that we've been sharing with those that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen.